Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. Uh, we're at the OG Command Center. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato here with my partner in crime and co-conspirator, Scott Bernstein. Hey, now. And we have our uh, engineer and videographer extraordinaire, Benny, in the house. Our producer. Producer extraordinaire. And this is uh, the first episode we've done uh, at the Command Center in a few weeks. We've been rec- we've had guests the last several weeks, so we've been re- doing some remote episodes. So it's fun to be back in person. And just want to remind everyone, please uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, subscribe to our audio podcast. Please like and share on social media. Uh, we're active on Facebook, Instagram, um, Twitter. Uh, we have some things in the works to become more ac- active on TikTok. So um, anyhow, it's really helpful to, to spread the word. It's still kind of a grassroots effort. Endeavor. And, um, and we, we, we do our best to acknowledge all of your uh, comments and questions. It, it's, it's not easy because it's just the three of us, but I, I try to at least like the comments, even if we don't always respond. So we appreciate your patience on that. I do want to thank the audience for over 1 million views on YouTube Yep, uh, in 12 months. So that's pretty so good. That is pretty good. Uh, thank you guys so much for listening and watching. Keep on growing it and good job. Thank bringing you, you this type of content. That. And hopefully uh, the more we grow it, the more resources we'll get, the more uh, support we'll get, and the bigger we can blow this thing up. Yeah, so thank you guys for pointing that out. Uh, today's topic, we're going to uh, look at uh, something that's in the news right now, and it's it's related to, to pop culture icons tupac and biggie we're going to look at the two murders there's a story that's in the news now related to the to the murder of tupac and i just want to remind the audience we like to mix it up a lot of our episodes obviously are about lcn or outlaw bikers but if you look at our archives we have episodes on the russian mafia on the mexican cartels we've done other audio episodes on the colombian cartels we like to talk about irish mobsters so um, we did an episode on the Black Mafia from Philadelphia a few weeks ago. So as professionals, as, as, as a criminologist, I'm a university criminologist. Scott is a crime reporter and author. We have a professional interest in all of this stuff, not, not just East Coast LCN, not just Outlaw Bikers. We have an interest in everything. So once in a while, we like to mix it up, and that's what we're doing today. And this is very relevant right now. I, I wouldn't have been inclined to do a Biggie Tupac episode just because. If, just you know, just because yeah. this is right now uh, the hottest. The investigation into the Tupac Shakur murder has been since it happened. Yeah. Um. We have search warrants being executed we have grand juries being convened we have potential um immunity deals being uh blown out of the water if some of the things that the police think that they can find with these search warrants if they do find it so there's a lot of motion and action right now around the shakur uh murder and it's something that has been so steeped in mythology and so embedded into pop culture in some in in some ways we kind of forget about the fact that there's never been any closure and there's so much talk about what happened and and i've heard other people say you know we kind of knew what happened for a while this is kind of solidifying some of it potentially but uh this is this is really hot news in terms of uh, invest investigation wise. We've never yeah. been at this point in terms of the fact that there's a grand jury about to be convened. And it's possible that in the next six months to a year, we could have arrests and, and indictments. Yeah. So I think what, what we want to do is start with discussing what the what what recently happened. Then we'll go back and unpack the, the, the murders themselves and, and what led up to that and the, and the subsequent violence and investigation. And then also, hopefully at some point, I want to talk about a round table with all three of us, just the cultural significance of this, why this is still so such an important story. So what, what happened just recently? You want to break that yeah, down? So in the last, uh, this, we're in July right now, um, in the middle of July, there were search warrants issued in Las Vegas and Clark County. Um, 
there was a search conducted at the house of a suspect, uh, Dwayne Davis, uh, former, I, I don't know what his status right now on the street is, but at one point in time, we know he was a member of the, the Crips um, gang in, in, in Los Angeles. He is someone whose name has been surrounding the alleged conspiracy and investigation for a very long time. He's somebody who has an immunity deal in relation to this crime, which makes you wonder, well, then why are they investigating him and why are they searching a residence that's connected to him? I believe it's his uh, either his wife's house or his girlfriend's house in, in Las Vegas. But what it tells me as someone with a law degree is that it it's pretty clear that authorities, whether they be just the state authorities or federal authorities are of the opinion that he lied to get his immunity deal. And if you lie uh, in, in cutting a deal with the government, the deal that you made is out the window. Right, which applies to an episode that by the time people watch or listen to this will will already be available, which is our episode about Frank Salami and the Stevie, Stevie DeSaro murder from you know the the New England uh, mafia back in the nineties. And Frank Salami could have easily walked free from that murder if he just would have copped to it during his uh, debriefing session in nineteen ninety nine. But instead, he was trying to protect a friend of his. Uh, and when they dug the body up uh, seventeen years later, and he was in witness protection. You know, he had to come pay the piper. The chickens had come home to roost. So I, I want to mention something and then ask you a question. The uh, executed the search warrant, as Scott points out, they, they took USB and hard drives, photographs, several computers, his iPhone, his tablets. I think, I think also some literature he had, maybe some, some pictures. Um, so that, that makes sense. That's sort of standard in this. But I want to ask you what you think from a legal perspective, and just as a veteran crime reporter. If you look at the footage, they sent the SWAT team in there, which I, I find very curious as a guy who has a, who has an immunity deal, that why do you think they came? A show of force? A, such a show just, of just force. show how, you know, top priority this is and how serious they're taking this. Yeah. Uh, and we know that, you know, people are human beings and things between law enforcement and uh you know the dark side of the law can sometimes get very personal mm -hmm. and get very uh contentious and from me talking to people that i know um that are either involved in this investigation or connected to people that are involved in this investigation keefe d made people very upset in these last five years with a book that he wrote and with appearances that he's made uh, on DJ Vlad, uh, some other uh, internet platforms yeah, he's where, he's, out there. where he's out there bragging yeah. about his role in this. Right. Um, and and uh, just back up one second and say what I think the ultimate end game in this investigation, what they're looking for and what they think he lied about is the murder weapon. Mm. Um, he claims that he doesn't know what happened. He, he doesn't know where the murder weapon got uh, stashed. Or I, I, th I believe he claims in his deal that the murder weapon was taken from his car the night or taken from the rented car that they had come out to Vegas for for the Mike Tyson fight. That's why everybody was there. Mm -hmm. uh, Tupac was very close to Mike Tyson when he died. Mm -hmm. He sometimes would come out uh to the ring yeah. with Tyson when when Tyson was walking out to fight Tyson back in 1996 when this happened was you know one of you know he's still an icon but back then he, one of the most recognized athletes on the planet um and this was his comeback this was part of his the first year that he was coming back uh after having to serve some prison time for a rape charge and just like you know a, a lot of major fights i know in in Detroit whenever Tommy Hearns would fight you know, everybody from the Detroit underworld would go. And I mean, literally in mass, you'd have hundreds of criminals leaving Detroit to go to Atlantic City or Las Vegas to follow Tommy Hearns. And I, I think you have when Tyson was fighting, um, you had a lot of guys from New York and a lot of guys from L.A. Uh, that wanted to come and, and 
and watch him fight. So, you know, Keefe D and, and some of his boys from the Crips, including his nephew, uh, Orlando Baby Lane Anderson, who plays a role in this, uh, rented a Cadillac and drove from L.A. to Las Vegas. In Keefe, deals, Keefe D's deal, he says after the murder, uh, they went, <laughs> again, he's admitting his role. <laughs> uh, after murder, they went and celebrated some, somewhere and they left the gun in the car, in the rented car. And when they came back to the rented car, the gun wasn't there anymore. Well, and also, in addition to the tablets and the pictures and phones, they also took shells. They took bullets. They're trying yeah, to match 40 to a, four, a 40 Glock. Uh, there's been a lot of mystery surrounding the murder weapon over the years. Um, the, the police have confiscated 40 Glocks in the past uh, and tried to test them. There's, uh, you, you know, there's, we still don't know exactly what's happening behind the scenes over the years in the investigation. I think there's a federal investigation and then there's a local uh, Las Vegas investigation, but I know there's been some uh, raids uh, of of residences, it, not recently, but you know, in the decades past, where they 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 found guns, and either the guns didn't come out uh, positive in the in the testing for what they're looking for, or in some cases, there's rumors that guns got lost, mm -hmm. uh, and that they can't find them, so we don't know if those. Mm -hmm. But it it's pretty clear that they think that Keefe D is lying to them about the murder weapon uh, and in my at least again in my opinion and that's what they're aiming for here is to find the murder weapon find the bullets and, and that the theory is that he would have kept it or he knows where it is as some type of memento is it possible that he's the trigger man and not his nephew I don't. I don't believe so. Okay. Uh, but okay. Let's let's. If people don't know, yeah. Let's uh, rewind it so the unpack like what happened that night. So that night, uh, Tupac and the the death row entourage is uh, going to Caesar Palace to go to the Tyson Bruce Seldon fight. It was a very. Qu I remember watching it as a eighteen year old. Very quick fight. Was and, that the unification fight? Was Sel Seldon had a title at that yeah, point? Yeah, it, it was. I, I remember, remember it was a. It was a not a good fight. No, no. Benny, Tyson look up. It. Look look it up. How Tyson uh, kicked the shit. How out long of that fight lasted? But I remember that, that might have been one of those unification fights where I think Tyson, it was September ninety six. Tyson, I think, had a belt at that point too. Um, and uh, according to to some of this narrative, before the death row entourage left LA for Vegas. There was an incident where the death row entourage is connected to the bloods because Suge Knight, who was the CEO of death row was a yeah. blood Mount unabashed, Pyru. unabashed. Um, and there was an incident where one of the bloods affiliated with death row had his chain snatch his death row chain snatched off him and maybe uh, physically assaulted allegedly by Keefe D's nephew, who was also a, a Crips gangbanger named Orlando Anderson and went by the nickname baby lane. Um, baby lane and Keefe D were at the fight as well, whether by coincidence or maybe not, they happened to run into each other. Um, some people believe it was staged. Yeah. Uh, but what we know, there's footage, security cam footage from Caesar's Palace in the immediate aftermath of the fight, like five or 10 minutes after the fight um, ended. So a first, a first round knockout. Uh, yeah, I remember. He one of the, the shortest heavyweight championship fights in boxing and, history. And, 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 as a matter of fact, I don't, we're going to digress here for a moment. But if you watch the fight, Benny, if you've ever seen that, it, there's a theory that Selden that he fixed it he, fix. yeah he felt I mean he doesn't even put up a fight like yeah. he goes down right away it's a joke of a fight I right. mean there's a waste of pay per view right <laughs> those of us that paid to watch that it was a joke so like ten minutes after the he took a dive the that's, decision that's a term I couldn't think of uh, Tupac and Suge and about twenty thirty people in their entourage are walking through Caesar's Palace uh, presumably to go to their vehicles and 
retreat back to their hotel or where Suge's house was, and they were going to reconvene at a, a, a club. They were gonna that, be, right, they were going to go to his club after. Uh, which was Suge owned a club, and Pac was going to perform. Um, and Pac at that time was staying at the Luxor, which is not... Uh, it, it, you know, you have to get into it. You can't, you can't walk from yeah. Caesars to the Luxor. Right. So as they're going to their, you know, to leave Tupac or someone with Tupac recognizes baby Lane Anderson. And you can see Tupac kind of solo. He initially rolls up conflict. to him. Yeah. People that were there say that he said something like you South side. Right. Which means that, you're a crip. Right. Uh, and then Tupac just swung on him. Yeah. He and, started. And he got stomped out. Uh, Anderson did. Baby Lane Anderson got stomped out for a good 20, 30 seconds. And then the death row guys dispersed, worried that they're going to be arrested or security's going to uh, come in. And I guess they had probably already started to try to break it up. And Tupac goes back to the Luxor to change clothes. And um, I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Shug went back to his house, and then at some point, Shug comes and picks up Pac at the Luxor, or Pac goes to Shug's house. I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, that's something I want to also bring up if we get in the weeds here, but I think it's interesting. The, the security, how there was this this bad chain of events because Tupac usually had two bodyguards with him. One of them wasn't there that night because of some falling out with like the, the death row people. The other bodyguard that was there was not armed because Suge did not file the proper paperwork for a guy from California to have a concealed weapon. So that's there's that. And Pac wasn't wearing his bulletproof vest. Put, yes, right. Which he was normally he was wearing when he was out in public. He said it was apparently he said it was too hot. hot. Yeah. And then also, um, the bodyguard wants to drive Pac to the location they're going. And Shug says, no, no I'll take it. I'll, I'll, I'll Cause I need to discuss some things with him privately. So there's really this chain of yeah, events. Unfortunate that really made it more conducive for them to be able to kill him. I think that there, makes were, sense. there are two important things to know contextually about what's going on behind the scenes. You know, the, the macro is that you have this bubbling East coast, West coast. Yeah. We got to talk about rap that too, war. Yeah. That was really more of a street war. Uh, and it wasn't manufactured by the press or the media, which is something they try to spin to you. I mean, this was, there were a lot of dead bodies. Uh, and the dead bodies kept on piling up after uh, both Biggie and Pac died and, and lasted into the 2000s. Yeah. So uh, it, it wasn't a um, some controversy or, or the source false theory. flag. Uh, you know, that, that's one of the, the theories you're talking about. They blame it on the source, right. source magazine. It was, the, the it was all cover, their fault. The cover of the and source the, magazine. Was, and the other was the other big magazine at the time. Um, Vibe. But right, it's all, it's all their fault for, for doing so it. So you had this, this whole situation that had popped up, popped off almost two years before. The end of 1994, uh, everything's copacetic. Pac and Biggie are friends. East Coast and West Coast have come together. But people should know, if you don't, even though Pac was representing West Coast, Pac was an East Coaster. That's right. Who, yeah. who went to the West Coast and started repping the West Coast. But uh, there was a famous shooting, a quad, a, a quad studio shooting, which, which really ignited this whole thing, where Pac and Biggie were both at a studio and seems pretty clear that there were people that wanted to rob Tupac uh, and Biggie probably knew about it or potentially knew about it. And uh, Pac got robbed, almost got killed. And, and Pac blamed Biggie and Puffy and that crew either for uh, taking part in the robbery or having knowledge and some type of interest in the robbery or having knowledge of it without an interest in it and not, not warning tipping him. them off, not warning him. Yeah. So let's cover a couple of things leading up to this feud, because I love to geek out on this. Uh, you know, I'm a huge Pac fan. Yeah, We're both. I mean, <laughs> I, this is my teenage years. That's all I listened to was Biggie and Tupac. Yeah, I still and, listen to Pac. Yeah, I, yeah, right. um, if you, if those of you who watched our episode a few weeks ago with um, Anjay, where we we're talking about the Chicago mob stuff, and the financial scams, 
that was a remote episode, but you'll see if you watch that, I'm repping my death row <laughs> records t-shirt in that episode. Um, so I mean, my love of, I, I guess you can kind of take it back possibly to run, and this is an aside to run DMC and NWA, but my real love of hip hop music and rap music yeah. was cultivated yeah. by that early to mid nineties. Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg. Yeah, it's the best. Biggie, Pac, Wu Tang. Um, and I, I'm a little bit older than Scott, a couple of years. So I, I was already listening to NWA, Public Enemy, Ice T. But I'm saying, so Tupac wasn't my, uh, he wasn't like the, the first guy that, that I was really into, but I felt like he was the best. But when he came out, I was like, well, this. This is the best shit. I used to listen I've to Digital heard. Underground, oh, so yeah. I knew about Pac yeah. before he became Pac. That's right. That's and I remember right. some of my one of my buddies coming to high school. I was fifteen years old, fourteen or fifteen. Maybe I wasn't even in high school at that point. And he's like, "Oh, remember you know Tupac from Digital Underground? He's got his own his own yeah. album." And I remember getting going somewhere and listening to it. Yeah, Tupac. And, I'm like, oh. and then I from that point forward, I was kind of a diehard Tupac fan. So, um, so Tupac suspects that either as you point out either they knew about it or at the very least didn't didn't tip either them were off. they either were invested in it yeah. and got a piece of it right or they knew about it and kept their mouth right. shut so either way he's he's hella pissed yeah so this is how it this is how it eventually gets into this mutates into this east coast west thing not just a thing of like of like Pac against like, upset with puffy and and biggie so the 1996 soul train awards in 95 it was 95 that was okay so that was but that that was one of the first the thing that happened it was august of 95 right where where that where there's a crowded um where they were in new york i'm pretty sure no the the uh the first incident is in at least according to this book okay. labyrinth uh by randall sullivan but maybe even think of the soul train awards this, well, the Soul Train Awards, according to this chrono, uh, chronology, is what is what happens first, and that's in L.A. where Biggie shouts out Brooklyn and the Death it wasn't Row the guys same, it wasn't go. The, I thought it was the same night because I'm pretty sure Biggie uh, shouts out Brooklyn. Suge gets on stage and says, if you want to be a rapper and not have your producer all up in the video or right, come to right. Death Row, and at the same, I'm pretty sure the same night, Snoop Dogg gets on stage and they start booing him, and he and yeah. he said, "Oh, you guys don't have you don't have any love for the West Coast." That but, was but, that didn't happen but on the see, West. Coast. I think, but that's the that's the next event, which that's is in New York, York okay. in September. Okay, okay, that's which what I'm, is which is where the point was the shitty attitude towards Snoop, and then was in response to Biggie getting booed at the Soul Train Awards. A little bit, a little earlier. bit earlier. Yeah. But in both cases, the entourages bump into and each get other into it. And, and get into it. And uh, where, you know, you can look at the whole thing like F you and the N word and everything going back and forth. And um, so it's now the over my overall point is it's becoming this kind of cancer where it's not just one dude pissed at another dude. It's becoming record labels pissed at each other and regions and, and, and it, it should be noted at this point in august and september of 95 tupac is locked up oh right and isn't interjected right. into this until october right so Pac goes to prison i think for eight nine months on a uh sexual assault uh i think a weapons charge and a sexual assault charge um and involving some of the people, by the way, who probably were the ones who arranged for his shooting. Yeah. <laughs> Haitian, ja Haitian Jack right, and those guys. Right. right. And he cannot afford an appeal bond because it's like a $2 million appeal bond. So, I mean, I, I analogize it kind of like if you're a, um, an NBA owner. And you've, you've had a, a couple championships, like, you know, if Suge is the NBA owner, he's had some championships with Pac, or sorry, he's had some championships with Dr. Dre and Snoop, and you're looking for that next superstar. Mm -hmm. And, and Suge says, well, I can go to prison and get him. Mm -hmm. And I can, if I can raise the 2 million, which it was pretty easy, I think for, for Suge to do, he goes to prison, has all the leverage in any contract negotiations. 
gets Tupac to sign a very bad uh, recording contract, gets him out, and Tupac goes on a you know a, a, is alive for the for another like ten months or eleven months, and he just goes on a recording spree. I mean, he's recording oh, yeah. every day, yeah, uh, you know, twenty songs a day or whatever. Yeah. That's why he's had so much posthumous yeah, yeah. releases. Yeah. But it's by the time we reach September ninety six, you've reached a point that Pac doesn't want to be at death row anymore. Pac is starting his own sub label called Euthanasia, and he has chainwear made for it. And I believe he was that wearing, night, that, wearing night. that chain for yeah. the first time that night. And there was, I don't know if I want, I, I, I don't know if I can say an argument. I know that there it's, were it was provocative. There were conversations between Pac yeah. and Suge about right. what Pac's future was at death row. Right. And also, and also, Pac was made it clear that when he was doing movies, he did not want death row to have any representation any when he, right. In terms and, of repping him or. And I think, I think one of the, re- which Suge did not take. Right. <laughs> very well. He wanted everything. He wanted a piece of like he wanted. Right. He's like a mob boss. You know, right. You, we have a piece of you, whether you do movies, <laughs> right. television, right. rap music. Right. Right. Um, and I think there was another element where, you know, Pac is going at that breakneck pace in from October of ninety five to when he died in September of ninety six. From what I've read and from people I've spoken to, part of that breakneck pace was to get through the contract. Yes. Was to get enough material yes. for Suge to have his contract's worth of money or of uh, singles and records. Right. And then he can go off and do his own stuff and Suge doesn't have any more piece of it. Right. And and it's you, you got to dig into it because some of the guys in the Outlaws who were that was Tupac's other group that he was involved in and actually some of those guys aren't around anymore either but um one of them was actually was killed. killed uh, it was one of the later. witnesses yeah, yeah. to the, to the right. murder and was killed a month later. But, two but later. Um, so some of the guys who were still around pushed back against that narrative. And they, they say, just for the record, I, you know, I don't know yeah. why I wasn't there, that, that no Tupac was ride or die with Suge. And, like, and, that, and that people are overstating like sort of Pac wanting to get away right. from Suge. So we don't know. We don't know. But some other th- interesting things happening around this time. Before Pac gets out of prison, um, the Dog Pound, which is on Death Row, Snoop Dogg's group, um, released a song called "New York, New York," where they went. To, I think they <laughs> shot. They, they shot. shot they York, shot it in New York. But was seen as provocative. Yeah. And Biggie goes on the radio there and says, "This is where the location is. New Yorkers, go tell them what's up." And so there's a drive-by shooting. They yeah. shoot up the 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 um uh whatever you call it the fucking what do you call it where, where they're filming what do you call it? the location the set shoot up the, the set. set yeah shoot up the set um so so then you have you have th- threats happening on both sides in this case an actual shooting um Pac gets out of jail and he's very vocal about his hatred and, and, for antag- and very antagonistic <laughs> and very antagonistic in both in interviews and in his yeah. songs yeah Right, hit well, him up. I mean, just uh, he starts off the song, hit him up. I fucked your yeah. wife, you fat motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> you <don't laughs> that's the start more. of the song. Yeah, that that's pretty antagonistic. Yeah. So so there's a there's a lot of heat and let's back not and forth. let's not. I mean, I, I believe he did sleep with his wife. And Faith Evans, I, I think that's Faith Evans, confirmed. you know, played into this she whole never thing. She denied it. She was upset with Biggie for being unfaithful to her. Right. And there was a time in the months leading up to, uh, uh, I don't know if it was the months or, it, at some point in 95, I believe, uh, or, or, or 90, uh, late 95 or early 96, Faith Evans runs into Tupac at a party in L.A., and it even takes a picture with him. Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, it's famous. It's a famous yeah. picture. And I think the, the, the I think that then hit him up came out in the spring of '96. So I think another interesting thing to point out here, um, in terms of trying to figure out who who did who ends up killing Pac, is in addition to some of the back and forth, fuck you, you know, we're we're we'll come after you, whatever. This is an interesting quote from Puffy, who says. 
the, you know, the, the core of his anger at us is about that recording studio shooting. And Puffy says, Pac ain't mad at the N-words that shot him. He knows where they're at. He knows who shot him. If you ask him, he knows, and everybody in the street knows, and he's not stepping to them because he knows he can't get away with that shit. Which, which is, mean which Haitian, is Haitian Jack, which mean Haitian, Haitian Jack, Jack. Right. who was a hardcore gangster, right. a big drug a dealer. killer, yeah, who was also an informant, yeah, and was protected, yeah, right. So, so that's an, that's interesting because um, if that's true, then there's this notion that Tupac's anger toward Bad Boy, which was Puffy's record label, and Biggie and all those guys, was unfounded. It was kind of a false flag. If, right. And so. Um, and then Biggie puts out the song, Who Shot You? Right, right. Which, I mean, you, Biggie, I, I remember, you know, tried to play the, oh, I, I wrote this and recorded this way before any of this happened, and it had nothing to do. Well, but the fact that you put it out right. when things were, were scorching hot, right. uh, it, it clearly stoked the flames. Yeah, I think, I think uh, and Tupac claimed, uh, yeah, who knows? But he claimed that he heard stuff in prison that confirmed his suspicions that Puffy and Biggie knew about it. Yeah. Um, so whether he thought they set him up or like you say, at the very least, they didn't they didn't warn him. He He's pissed off about it. But Puffy Puffy takes exception to that and says, no, we had nothing to do with that. And the real dudes who did that you, you're not fucking with them because right <laughs> you won't get away with it. And. There's a there's a, another theory, by the way, that it was supposed to be a mugging that went bad. Uh, that Haitian Jack and who was the other? We're talking about the '94 right, Quad the, Studios, the, the original shooting. That um, Jimmy Henchman and, and right, they Haitian wanted Jack. to send a message to him that they were going to just steal his chain and shit. Um, and that Pac tried to pull his gun, and he might he, have, and he <laughs> ended up shooting himself in the balls. Right. Right. So that it wasn't actually a hit. Yeah, it, it was a it was a robbery to send a yeah. message, and it went that he might have even just shot himself. Um, but it's just kind of interesting details surrounding but, this. But bring us up, or let's go back to the night. Yeah, uh, the allegation is, and it and it seems to be confirmed by Keefe D himself, um, as Pac and Suge are making their way to the club. At the uh, intersection of uh, Flamingo and Koval, Keefe D and his entourage, which included Baby Lane Anderson, who was his nephew, and the guy that got stomped out an hour or two earlier, yeah. come upon the, the, the convoy of, of death row uh, vehicles with Tupac and Suge at the front of it. They heard, I guess, some girls that were running up to the car and trying to get autographs. Yeah. There was a picture taken yeah. in the Moments seconds before, before yeah. he's uh, shot. And according to Keefe D, uh, his nephew, Baby Lane, pulls up, uh, they pull their, their Cadillac up to, uh, I think it was Shug's Benz. Uh, I, it was I, either I, a Beamer. It, I, I think it was a Beamer, but I, I can't remember. And Baby driving. Lane Anderson uh, is Tupac's killer, uh, unloads his clip, I think it was a Beamer, but... And Pac, who's in the front seat, uh, front passenger seat, Suge's driving, Pac tries to jump in the back mm -hmm. as the hit's occurring and doesn't make it, and Suge is grazed by a bullet on his head, and then the, the Cadillac, which has four people in it, Keefe D, Baby Lane Anderson, a guy named Bubble Up, who ends up being killed mm -hmm. in Los Angeles, at mm -hmm. a, I think at a dispo. Mm -hmm. And then another guy, uh, I'm, 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 I can't think of that guy's name right now, but within two years, baby lane is killed. So baby lane is killed in the summer of 98. He had been, he'd been investigated as the shooter in this. He denied it, said that he was a big Tupac fan, um, loved his music. Well, and never he, heard and him. he even doesn't tell on Suge about the assault, right? Because Suge is in trouble for violating his parole or his, his probation. probation. Yeah. And 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 Babyface Anderson actually says no, he was trying to break it up. Yeah, which the video footage doesn't really. 
<laughs> to me, lend, that, lend right. yourself to believing that narrative. Right. So I think that was sort of a no snitching kind of thing. So you have all this speculation. You have uh, a bunch of, you know, what I call fallout murders. Um, if you go to, you know, my gangster report website, plug, plug, hit the siren, Benny, uh, <laughs> and you put in a search um, for, for Tupac murder, you can find, I, I did a, a number of stories and timelines on uh, the number of murders that occurred after Tupac's and Biggie's uh, murders. And again, this was not, this was something that was very real and lasted for years after the, the, these murders that took place in 96, 97. Uh, in the 2000s, Keefe D gets caught up in a drug case and cops a plea. And as part of that plea deal, he debriefs on what he knows about the Tupac murder and gets immunity for it and points the finger at his nephew and tells of all the circumstances leading up to it. He kind of, I think makes it, um, he says in his book, basically this was, this was real life gangster shit. And if you try to, uh, you know, you act like that towards guys like us who are real gangsters, you're going to find out why they call us real gangsters. Well, even, even if you look at some of the interviews with those blood OGs, uh, the mob pyro guys, they will even say that Pac was in over his head and that they would warn him, at least according to them, that they would warn him and Suge to you need to make sure Pac understands that he's an artist and an entertainer and he's getting in over his head. It was a clip talking shit, hanging out with gangbangers. And For shit people like that, that study Tupac, it, it, it's undisputed that this. Uh, persona that he takes on in the last couple years of his life is a ginormous overcompensation um, of the real kind of Tupac that you saw in his teenage years and in his first years rapping where he was not someone who embraced a thug life. He was not someone that was ultra aggressive or ultra provocative or ultra um, antagonistic to the point of uh, almost, you know, wanting to be hurt. He had all these incidents when he was a recording artist, run-ins with the law, run-ins with gangbangers. After he had his first music contract, he had no right. run-ins with the law before he was a rapper and an actor. Yeah, I mean, or with I, other people. I, yeah, I would say that. Um, another way of looking at it is that. It wasn't so much overcompensating, but that prison made him. Oh yeah, that too. I'm sure that that, that yeah hardened him, him and, and yeah. jaded him. Um. So, but 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 definitely right. That wasn't. I mean, he was he was, before that he was a very creative soul, artistic guy. He yeah. was in all sorts of kinds of music. He liked rock rock music, folk music. He was he was a genuine artist. He was into poetry, yeah. reading philosophy. Yeah, he was not like a what the thug life stuff happened. Later, <laughs> no, he was in, influenced by the people right. he surrounded himself right. by. Right, and I, I firmly believe, and I've heard other, other people say this, so I don't want to take credit for it, but I firmly believe if Tupac had never been killed, we would be talking about Tupac right now as one of the great actors, yeah, and creators, directors, producers. I think so. Um, he, he was that prolific. Yes, like this. This isn't someone that would have just, you know, he was twenty four when he died. Uh, I can't imagine what he would have created into his thirties and forties and fifties. Um, he was engaged to Kadada Jones, who was uh, Quincy Jones's daughter. And I know that in the year leading up to his uh, murder, he became very close with Quincy Jones. Well, QD3 produced some of All yeah. Eyes on Me. Right. That's Quincy's son. other son. And I can't imagine with that as your mentor, he only mentored him for less than a year. So yeah. I can't imagine going forward if, if he would have had Quincy Jones as his father-in-law, um, how far he could have gone outside of the yeah of and, he, the and he, he's point out he was already doing movies yeah um, he was already you know, some great tupac movies if you've never seen them juice poetic yeah. justice i love gang related even though it's kind of a bad movie i think it's yeah gridlock gridlock is a, is a great kind of uh, it takes place in detroit it's kind of it's a so kind of a social uh yeah commentary well also Pac was very we're getting sidetracked a little bit here but he was also very socially conscious and and a political revolutionary I yeah mean, uh, his mother his, well, he comes from the Black Panther. Uh, Shakur, Matula Shakur. His, his stepdad just died uh, yeah. a couple weeks ago. So, but so he 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 was he was a he was born he was dude. born in the middle of a revel in a, as a part of the revolution. Yeah, um, 
he so the, the one thing I want to also so add I guess in that is, way he's all I guess in that way maybe I'm wrong I guess in that way he was already kind of naturally antagonistic because he comes from you know the blood of Black Panthers well I would say I would say militant yeah um he he definitely had that pedigree um which is not necessarily mean thug life though mm -hmm. um and then later on he sort of kind of merges it what what like Michael Eric Dyson calls like thug revolutionary where where he starts becoming sort of like uh a mutation of both the yeah. kind of social conscious political kind of thing with, with the mixed with the, with the gangster stuff. But, but, but one thing I want to add here, because I keep on going back to the, the, the puffy guys, puff daddy and biggie and those guys is because they knew that Shug was connected to the bloods. When puffy and those guys were in LA, they would hire the Crips to be their security I, detail. And I think even in New York, they had some connection to some Crips. And in New York, they also had a connection to another group that we've talked about quite often uh, on this podcast, the Black Mafia family, who hadn't fully coalesced at that point. But um, I know that there was, you know, startup cash that was given to Puffy uh, from, from people that were connected to BMF for bad boy. Uh, and at that point in time, 96, 97, Terry, uh, big Meech's brother, Southwest T is living in LA. Yeah. So the, both record labels have some sketchy yeah. relationships, but I, I think why it's, it's interesting to point out the, the crip connection, specifically the LA Crips is, it lends itself to this theory that shooting Pac was not a spontaneous reaction to the beatdown, beat which casino. leads some people to believe that the beatdown was actually kind of a, a, a facade and a, a setup. Well, the, the, a, the Anderson went there to know that it would provoke them right, to, right. to assault him. Yes. Right. Uh, and then that leads us to some of the reporting that has been done um, in the LA papers. Uh, at first, I had a hard time believing it, but uh, the further along we get, I'm more open to it, that this murder came from the Crips on some type of either a contract or a, ta a tacit agreement uh, from Biggie and Puffy. Um, right. And that Keefe D has told people or other people in Keefe D's orbit have told people that um, Keefe was familiar with Puffy, that Puffy and Keefe would uh, socialize in LA and New York, that there was some type of conversation within a meeting or within a meal uh, in 96 where, where Puffy was complaining about Suge and Pac and how he either wanted them dead or would be happy if they were dead, or I don't know if the word dead came up, but they wanted them out of the way or something. Maybe that it wasn't necessarily, hey, I am going to pay you X amount to do this. But the Bloods and Key, or sorry, the Crips and the Keefe D crew took it to mean if we do this, we can get X, Y, and Z. And that they, they did it on the belief that Puffy wanted it done and then went back to Puffy and said, okay, we did it. Now you owe us money. Um, and, and Puffy pushed back on that, basically saying, I never told you to do it. You misinterpreted me, and I ain't paying anything. Well, and another another interpretation is that uh, that the bad boy people felt that this was a preemptive that they they felt that that Suge was going to try to have them killed. Yeah, and and that they needed to they needed to hit them first. Um, so I, I, again, with speculative, according to one informant and in one of the stories that I believe was uh, published in, in the L.A. Times. And again, I have a hard time believing this, but uh, that Puffy gave the gun yeah. to, the, to the kill team, saying, I want you to shoot him with this gun. Yeah, I want they, they had to walk that, but then the newspaper had to walk yeah. that back. <laughs> yeah, I, I find it difficult to believe. Yeah. <laughs> too. Um, uh. And uh, so you, you had a situation where it, it's, you know, it's, it, you still don't know. Um, but you can, what we know for sure is that there are connections between the people that we believe killed Tupac, at least tangentially, to Biggie and Puffy. 
Yeah, and then and then the the what we have to add to this is, of course, as Scott pointed out, there's subsequent violence after the murder of, of Tupac on, on the streets of L.A. between the Bloods and the, and the Crips. But the most the most high profile murder, of course, is the murder of Biggie Smalls, right, which happens himself. five months later, four right. months later. Five. And then and then you have these one theory, which is five months th- later. that 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 if if the Crips were pissed off about being double crossed, that they took out Biggie. I don't buy that. I think. It's probably people in the death row camp that that in retaliation for for Tupac's and murder. you can and if you deep dive it, you can find connections between suspects yes. in the Biggie hit yes. to death row yeah to the uh, corrupt parts of yeah. the LAPD yeah guys that were blood affiliated yeah and it's it's challenging. I'm not trying to defend the law enforcement here because it's actually, they have a black guy. It's, it's, I mean, that's something we could discuss too at sort of a meta level. Um, but it, it is challenging in a way because a lot of these guys end up dead in the, in the subsequent 20 which, years, which is what I kind of feel if I'm going to play what, amateur, 25, whatever years it's been amateur like. psychiatrist here with what's going on in Keefe D's head over these I last need, couple of years. To, I need to take math lessons. It's been what? 27 years now. Uh, 26. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like 20 years. No, 20, 27, 27, 27, 30, 27 right. Jesus Christ. Biggie. Well, I said we were talking about Biggie. It's been right. 27. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Finish your thought. No, wait, Biggie. Uh, I can't count. Nine, what's 96. 96 to 2023. That's what I mean. That's what I'm It's 27, 27, 97 to 2003. <laughs> it's too humid here in Detroit. I can't is 28. Think. Yeah, so it's almost 30 years at this point. But the point is, in that, whatever, almost 30 years, almost everybody affiliated with this case is dead, yeah. except for Puffy, Keefe D, and maybe... Which, which, which again, people. I think emboldened Keefe D, feeling like, I can say whatever I want, there's nobody here to contradict me. Yeah, right. And I'm right. confident that they're never going to find the gun that I'm hiding, if you believe he's hiding the murder weapon. Right. And another sort of footnote to this, which, which our audience maybe that's more interested in the Italian LCN stuff is a, a real pivotal figure in this narrative is David Kenner, who is the official lawyer for Suge, Pac, got, got I mean, I'm sorry, got Snoop out of a murder case Row records. Got, so got Snoop acquitted right, of a murder case, right? With, I think Johnny Cochran too, I think was yeah. part of that legal team. David Kenner is considered like the superstar defense attorney. And allegedly he's, a connected lawyer in New York, and specifically, usually, it's he's he's um, identified as having connections to the Genovese family. Some I've people never call been able to in, corroborate in, that. In, they were, they, again, like Jimmy said, we haven't been able to corroborate this, but the press back then would refer to him as like an in-house counsel for the Genovese. Yeah, and he was like on retainer for yeah. anybody in the Genovese that got into yeah, trouble. Yeah, they that was put out a lot. I I, I can't find anything that. That backs that up, but it it could be true. The way and that Bruce Cutler was for for, for guy for the Gambinos, yeah. And 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 one of the reasons why I think it's a it's an interesting footnote is that's precisely why Suge wanted him on his team because Suge right. loved the, the mafia idea. stuff. <laughs> he lived in Lefty Rosenthal's house, Ace Rothstein, the movie that you saw a <laughs> casino. casino, yeah, like that house that you see that Ace Rothstein's living on, yeah. After that movie, yeah. Suge buys that house. Right. And is that's the house that they're going to before the shooting. Right. And and so he he loves that whole mystique. He would he would have the the uh, Death Row guys, they would have to watch Bugsy and the Godfather movies. And how did Death Row get started? It got started through Harry O, Michael Harris, yeah. one of the biggest drug dealers in the history of Los Angeles. And he was not just a silent partner. No. People didn't realize at that time, everyone thought Suge was the final right. say. Suge wasn't the final say. Harry O was. Not initially. But then, but then Suge. Then, then they, put, and then they pushed, pushed Harry O out. And then he ends up suing, suing them. Yeah. He ends up suing Suge. But, um, but also, um, he also puts Suge, also hires uh, Spilatro as his lawyer. No, Goodman. Goodman and Spilatro. He, Spilatro's uh, son. Oh, okay, okay, okay. He, yeah. he also hired. For obvious reasons, yeah, 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 <laughs> because he loved Casino, he loved that film. So, um, it, you know, we'll see what happens in terms of um, the, you know, if 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 they can um, 
arrest anyone in this case. I, I think it, it is a black eye on law enforcement, both local law enforcement in California and It's embarrassing Nevada. that it's 30 and years later. And at the federal level. Have, um, I said to Jimmy off, uh, off camera, and I, I remember talking to my father about this over the years. My dad can't wrap his brain around why this is a big deal. And it's like, well... To bring it to you know in, to his level, what what if in the 1960s Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin got into some big uh, you know dispute and they and their camps end up killing each other? Yeah. You think 30 years after that we would have had no answers? No, I, it, it's it's I, right. I don't buy that. So one thing we want to do is is talk about the the finish up here the, the cultural significance of this, and and I have this sort of hypothesis that like people who are like in Scott's dad's age don't quite appreciate it. But then also younger people, I have a lot of students in my criminology classes. Unfortunately, the reality now is they're so used to rappers getting killed that they're sort of like, well, how is it? What's the big deal? Doesn't this just happen all the time? And I would say, A, not back then, but B, Pac and Biggie are on another level, in my opinion, yeah. as artists. Um, and you can't compare them to it's like the Beatles. Like they're the Beatles. <laughs> right. They're the Beatles. One of the mill guy who gets re- they're the Beatles, or they're Duke Ellington, right. or they're who gets uh, killed as a and he Elvis to be Presley. A I mean, that- so we've got we could do an actual experiment here because we have someone who's in the middle, someone who's older than my college students, but but younger than us. So so Ben, the producer engineer. What 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 are your thoughts? Is this, is this a big deal? This story is it still a big deal, or are we just geeking out? It's it's definitely still a big deal. Um, Tupac and Biggie are uh, icons in the rap community. People still consider them uh, the best all time. Uh, a lot of people still have them in their top five. Um, among the millennial Gen Z generation. People younger than me who listen to, you know, Little Baby and all that, uh, <laughs> they couldn't care. But people my age, even though, you know, people my I was one and almost right. two years old uh, when Tupac got killed. Um, we still looked into it, you know what I'm saying? Um, know about it. Know that Biggie got shot. And stuff like that. So, uh they are two people that still transcend generations. And I think it is important news. Um, the problem is in our news cycle, you know, every other second something else happens yeah. on Twitter. Yeah. You gotta that, con- I think that's more the reason yeah, why it's con- not as big. Contextualize it. When yeah. they both died, the internet had just started. Yeah. Yeah. There was no social media. No. Cable was, you know was around and you had a, you know, a nice selection on, on television, but there was, uh, that was the only place you went. It was still, it wasn't, we weren't at the point in the eighties where we were kind of like, you still had just the three, you know, ABC, NBC, CBS. You were now in the point where you had more uh, options, but it was still your media consumption was very, there was a very narrow lane and you got what people gave you. Mm-hmm. What MTV was giving you, what your radio was, station was, was giving top you, down. it's not like today yeah. was decentralized. So I mean, Pac and Biggie, with me, you know, in my teenage years, they were so, and, and same with Dr. Dre, and 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 uh, Snoop, Snoop. I mean, they were so um, ubiquitous. Um, You're popular, yeah, every, yeah, and I and I will say that just. I mean, probably no one cares, but just to be autobiographical here. um, When I talk about these tragic losses in the 90s, for me, you know, a lot of a lot of people, it was the the suicide of Kurt Cobain that that really hit them personally. And I can understand why I'm a Nirvana fan. But for me, the, the, the Tupac murder hit me a lot. It hit that, me a lot. I tell a hundred times I was harder. A way big, I was a way bigger Tupac fan than I was I, Nirvana. And I say that as you, you guys who watch this, who watch our show, I'm a fucking heavy metal dude. So like I, I, I you know, I, I love rock music. I live it. I, I, I breathe it, um, especially heavy music. But uh, just as comparing those two, I, I'm a way bigger Tupac fan than than I was a Nirvana fan. So yeah, Cobain didn't have that effect on me. I think no. honestly, I was in terms of that type of music because I have a very eclectic taste. 
Um, I was big into Pearl Jam. If Eddie Vedder had committed suicide at the same time Kurt Cobain did, it probably would have hit me harder. Um, I, we can go down this rabbit hole off camera. Uh, I'm not a huge Nirvana fan. I recognize their significance. Yeah. Um, I like a couple of their songs a lot, but in general, I'm not a ginormous fan of their catalog. I don't go deep with them either. Uh, but, uh, yes. I mean, the, the, the Tupac and Biggie murder, I can remember where I was when I heard the news. I can remember how much it affected me. I, I, I'm an embarrassed to, to, to say this, but I'll admit it to, to my audience. I believe on the 10 year anniversary, I was in Las Vegas and me and my buddy went and bought some uh, uh, liquor Poor awesome and, and went, <laughs> went to the corner, went to the corner of Flamingo and Coval. And I, I this is, again, it shows you kind of how sometimes uh, I thought, I'm like, oh, it's a 10 year anniversary. There's going to be all these people out there. There's going to be this huge, you know, group of mourners. Oh, we're the only ones there. <laughs> we're at the corner. I mean, do you guys realize that this is where Tupac was killed 10 years ago today? Yeah. And that in 10 years, I mean, that, that's, that wasn't long, you know. Yeah, that was in 2006 or something. But I mean, we, I, I just, um, I love the death row stuff. I, I, not trying to say it wasn't tragic. I, I never was a huge, like, Biggie fan or the East Coast stuff. I mean, I loved Wu Tang. But like, um, I was, uh, we, the guys I ran with, man, we repped death row. Yeah, so I, I started as a huge <laughs> pot guy and then I went to college in, in Indiana and it doesn't sound like it, but uh, a big group of New Yorkers go to IU. Uh, and I became friends with a lot of New Yorkers, uh, maybe in the last year or two of Biggie. He only was around for, I think, three or four years. Yeah, yeah. Right. And uh, that's the other thing. Both careers were pretty it, it short. It seems like they were like around forever, but they, they so weren't. They, they got me in. I remember my first couple months of college, them kind of inundating me with Biggie and Wu Tang and yeah. Tribe and um, Nas and uh, Jay Z. And uh, they, they got me to appreciate the East Coast. But yeah, I, like you're saying, I, yeah. I was all West Coast yeah, that until was I was eight, 17 or 18. Yeah, I always, always prefer, even now I, I, I listen to, I mean, I, I, there's some exceptions. I love Woo, Old School Public Enemy. You see on the show, I rep those bands with my, with the groups with my shirts, but t-shirts, but uh, to this day, to me, you can't beat the Death Row stuff. Tupac, Snoop, Dre, The Chronic, can't beat it. Just, Mostly. A, just a couple of fact corrections. Tupac was 25 when he passed. Thank you. And um, it was a BMW 7 Series. Okay. See, this is what yeah. we need, yeah. like on um, PTI. They used to have the om- errors and omissions. Oh, yeah. Because I'm getting checked. You know, I, we'll deal with this in another uh, video, but I'm getting checked right and left sometimes on, on some of our videos. And I want I want to be checked. Sure. So uh, but sometimes, you know, when you when you have all this uh, information in the old noggin, sometimes you can get the signals crossed. So, well, I hope they I hope they can bring some closure on these cases to the, the to the loved ones that are left. I mean, Tupac's mother's dead. I think. Is Biggie's mom? Is she? I don't. I'm not sure if she's alive I thought, either. I thought Biggie's mom was alive and Tupac's mom. Yeah, Pac's mom is dead. If Pac's that, mom's dead, say. I think Vio, I think Valletta Wallace is dead now too. I think so too. But um, but there are still some loved ones and friends and other family, and then also just for the fans and just for the justice system. Like it, it's uh, you know for all these unsolved murders, um, for these. But Matulu people, Shakur, but, who raised Pac, he died yeah. in prison a couple yeah. of weeks ago. Yeah. Um, and, and Pac was, again, he was raised in this revolutionary environment. Oh, yeah. I mean, his mom was a major player in the Black Panthers. And then Matulu Shakur and Geronimo Pratt, yeah. who were, were Pac's main you know I mean? father, uh, father figures. Yeah. These were, I mean, these weren't like small time players in the Black no, Panthers. These are icons now in yeah. revolutionary left wing politics. And, um, and then Asata Shakur is another iconic yeah. figure around the revolutionary left. And I, I mean the real left, not fucking yeah. liberals. I'm right. talking about the real, <laughs> the real left. Um, so, um, but anyhow, I, I hope people enjoy this episode. Uh, I had fun doing this. Uh, we'll continue to think about bringing you a mix of, of, of content. And uh, again, please like, subscribe, follow us. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato. Scott Bernstein. And we're out. <laughs>